I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon when nailed to the tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I loved thee, my Jesus, tis now. Can you say amen to that? Bless his holy name. Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, please. <coughs> Mark's Gospel, chapter 5. You'll know these verses as soon as we begin to read them. If I can find it. Mark's Gospel, chapter 5. We're beginning in the chapter at verse 25. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Mark chapter 5, verse 25. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest a multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her daughter, Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Just a simple story tonight, and we trust, as always, that the Lord's blessing will rest upon his truth for his name's sake. Straightforward story before us in these verses this evening, a well-known story. In fact, a story I know, a portion that I've spoken on from this pulpit on a previous occasion. It's a story of need and even a story of, in many ways, despair. It's a story of faith, a story of trust. And praise God, we find once again here that Jesus meets the need. But let me just fill in a little bit to the background. You will know this anyhow. This little story, Mark sandwiches this story into the middle of another story. That's how Mark writes his gospel. You will find time after time, as you read through Mark's gospel, he embarks, he takes you on a story, and somewhere in the middle of that story, another story comes in. And he tells that story to you, and then he finishes the one that that story had interrupted. Does that make sense to you? They call it, I think they call it sort of like sandwich writing. But here's the thing. You will always find the story that's inserted in the middle of the other story has something very much in common with what the other story is about as well. And so here we have a woman. She has an issue of blood 12 years. Jesus is on his way with a man, a synagogue leader called Jairus, who has a daughter who's ill, who's 12 years of age. And so there's comparisons here. Mark's throwing stuff together here that points to certain things. And so Jesus makes his way along with Jairus. His, Jairus' daughter is seriously ill. In fact, by the time Jesus gets there, Jairus' daughter has already died. She's already passed away. But in this situation, in the meantime, Jesus is on his way to heal that girl whenever this story that we have here, whenever this happens. What an inspiration. This would have been for Jairus. Jairus has come from the synagogue. He's the leader of the synagogue. In many ways, possibly antagonistic to the Lord Jesus Christ, to this uh, radical teaching of Jesus. 
to this seemingly new move of, of what Jesus is encouraging people to do. And yet Jairus comes from that situation. He's the leader of the synagogue and he seeks out Jesus because his daughter is, is ill. And Jesus makes his way to be with him, to be with the girl, to meet the girl's need. The woman, on the other hand, she comes amongst the crowd. She shouldn't even have been there. She had no right touching the hem of Jesus' garment according to traditional law. And yet in the story, she does that very thing. And as we have read, Jesus meets her need as well. But what an inspiration for Jairus as he takes Jesus to minister to his daughter who at this time, as far as he knows, is simply ill. Let's look at this because the first thing I want you to consider in this story is this woman's disease. Look at verse 25 for just a moment or two. Verse 25. It says, And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years. Folks, I want to say tonight, her very life was slowly ebbing away because of her situation. The Bible says the life is in the blood. And here's a woman and her life is ebbing away. You know, there's a hymn that says, life at best is very brief, like the falling of a leaf, like the binding of a sheaf. And then the encouragement comes, be in time. For every single one of us tonight, life is ebbing away. You will be one hour older tonight whenever you leave this building. That's if I finish up in an hour. But you'll be an hour older by the time you leave here than before you came in. If you're spared until tomorrow, you're a day older than you were whenever you rose out of bed this morning. And life slips past. Life ebbs away. Life comes to us. There's a time in life, whenever you're younger, you look at life and, you know, you, you realize that God's in control and God may call you home, but if he doesn't, life seems so far, so long in front of you. And then all of a sudden, you come to a stage in life where you're beginning to look back. And it seems that there's much more behind you than now seems to lie ahead of you, even if the Lord spares you. Because life at best is very brief. And life is ebbing away. And for the lady in this story, she has this issue of blood. The life is in the blood. Her life is being drained continually, ebbing away from her. I want you to think of three things about this woman very quickly. First of all, I want to say tonight that she was weak because of what this was doing to her. Her strength had been diminished. Her strength had been depleted. The blood the flow of blood, the life is every week. She was weak because of what this was doing to her. The second thing is this. She was unclean because of this situation. And that meant as far as the synagogue, as far as the temple was concerned, she was not considered to be clean enough to be amongst other people. That's why I've already said she shouldn't even really have touched Jesus in the first place according to their law. So we see how she feels within herself. We see how she's recognized by those around her. And the third thing that we see is that she was miserable. Miserable. Her ongoing condition and the limits and the restrictions that it placed on her was bound to have made her completely miserable. Whenever you're sick for a period of time, it makes you miserable, doesn't it? And some of you know that much better than I do. I look back to the operation I had in December and I had to spend three or four weeks around the house. I did what I could do, but I was able to do nothing practically, to be quite honest. Came and went from church, did what we had to do in church here. But the other physical things and the things that I would normally be occupied with in my own time just was completely unable to do. I want to tell you something. Greta would tell you I was the most miserable person on God's earth during those weeks. Am I right or wrong? <laughs> Uh, she was miserable. So we see these three things. She was weak. She was unclean. And she was miserable. And I see her a picture of what sin does. As I want to tell you tonight, sin is like a cancer that eats at the soul. 
Sin is like a cancer that gets a hold of someone. And it just grows. And it grows. And it grows. And it grows. And often, whenever we find ourselves in the grip of sin, we are powerless. And we are weak against that sin. And often that sin makes people miserable. Miserable. They look at their lives. They look at the things that they do. You know, sometimes in church life, we come down on people who do certain things that we class as being sinful. But if truth be told, those who are involved in those things are people who are miserable. And not only that, but sin makes us unclean in the sight of a holy God. This is a picture of sin. We're unclean in his sight because of sin. He's a God who is pure, and he's a God who is upright. He is a God who can have nothing whatsoever to do with sin. And this woman has been 12 years in this process of dying. We see her disease. The next thing that we see here is her effort. If you look at verse 26 that we read together, it says she had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered, but rather she grew worse. She had suffered many things at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had. You see, she knew there was something wrong. She knew that she was diseased and she was willing to give and did give her all that she might sense that she might secure some kind of deliverance from her misery. Who wouldn't do that? Who wouldn't do that? That's how she did. And she had done all that she could do to get out of the situation. And it had brought her pain. It had brought her difficulty. It had cost her, the Bible tells us here, all that she had. Whatever bit of money she had managed to save, whatever she seemed to have behind her, now it's all gone. Her resources are completely depleted. And rather than getting better, the Bible tells us she grew worse. She had done her best. She had given everything to get rid of this. But nothing had made her better. Sincere effort, everything, nothing that was within her reach or within her capability was spared. She was earnest in her search for help to be changed, put every effort into being changed. But the verse speaks of her failure. Again, verse 26, she grew worse, her failure. Nothing that she had, nothing that she had tried, had worked. And let me say it again, she grew worse. Now all her money's gone. All of her resources are gone. All of her means is gone. And she's without hope as far as her own resources are concerned. Sickness, disease, folks, it operates like that. But beyond that, let me say again tonight, so does sin. I have talked to people over the years who have tried to turn over a new leaf. Maybe before you were saved, you did exactly the same. You know, God was speaking to you, perhaps. God was convicting you of sin and, and unsure of how to deal with that or how to cope with that. You maybe had tried to be a better person. You maybe had tried to turn over a new leaf only to find that you had failed. And soon you were back to your old ways. I often tell people before we get saved, I used to go to church. We, we, we spent a number of years where we never would have been in a church door in those early years of our marriage and so on. And after, after the children, after uh, Samantha was the oldest, after Samantha came along, I remember thinking, you know, I need to get back to church again. Because I wanted the children to be brought up in the same way as, as we had been brought up. And I would go into that church building on a Sunday morning. And we had little kneeler things. Whenever they were saying prayers, you could sit in your seat. Or you could kneel down on these little knee, knee pads. And folks, listen, I used to do that every Sunday morning life. Whenever the times would have come on the service for prayer, I would have been down on my knees. I would have been reaching out to God, trying to take part in everything that was happening. Do you see, whenever I left the building, into the car, 
and the first thing would have been a cigarette out of my pocket. And then life was lived throughout the week just the same as life had been lived the previous week and the following Sunday morning back into church trying to do the best you could do again. And so many people live their lives like that. Earnest people, sincere people, trying to do what they can do, only to find that nothing helps. Turning over a new leaf, but you feel the very next day, you're back to the old ways again. I've talked to people who have tried different things, but they couldn't find help. This woman had tried many things. Listen, she had tried Dr. False Peace. Oh, come to me. I'll be able to do something for you. Dr. False Peace. She had tried Dr. Good Enough. This will be good enough to get you sorted out. She had tried Dr. Do Better. She had suffered at the hands of some of these people. Some of the things that they were trying to get her do, to do. To do better and so on. To do enough. But none of them could help her. And none of these can touch the sore of sin in your life or in mine either. Can't touch deep enough. Can't get to the core. Can't get to the root of the problem. And whenever you talk to people who have tried these things, whenever you talk, for example, to someone who's addicted in some way to some substance or to alcohol or to whatever it is, he or she will say to you, I can't change. He or she will say, there's nothing that can help me. He or she is miserable and they feel that they are without hope, bound, gripped in bondage in that situation that they find themselves in. And folks, there are so many people, and listen to me, that's how they feel in the world of which we live in today. That's exactly how they feel. They've tried. Some of them have tried and tried and tried and tried and failed. And today... They feel that they're without hope. See, what a picture this woman is here. Because there are so many others like her. Could that be a picture of your life in this service tonight? Tried. Aye, and maybe tried again. And maybe tried again. And maybe have tried again. But nothing ever seems to change. Could that be you here in this service tonight? Because what a picture this woman is. So many like her. Disease, she had a problem. Effort, she had tried. Failure, nothing would ever change. But look at what we see here. Because next in this story, verses 27 and 28, we see faith. Let me read you those verses. When she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press. She came amongst the crowd behind. And she touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. What made her think like that? What put that idea across her mind? What made her feel in her heart that if she could just touch his clothes, she'd be better? You see, friends, she had heard of Jesus. This man, Jesus of Nazareth, this man healed people. She had heard of how the blind were able to see. She had heard of how the cripples had been able to walk. She had heard about demons that had been cast out. She had heard about deaf people whose ears were, were unstopped and they could hear. No doubt she had probably heard about the lepers, the outcasts of society. Even the lepers, praise God, had been set free and cleansed. By this man, Jesus of Nazareth. He had met on one occasion a funeral procession. He was making his way into a little town called Nain. And there he meets the cortege coming out of the town. And, 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 and the young man, he's being buried by his mother. The young man's father's dead. And the Bible says Jesus touched the beer and the young man rose to life again. No doubt she had heard about those things. Jesus was able even to bring back the dead, raise them back to life again. This man, Jesus, that she had heard of was different. 
This man taught. This man spoke different. This man had power that was different. This man possessed something about him that was different. This man had something about himself that was different from any other person that she had ever heard of or probably any other person she had ever met. And she had heard these things about him. Oh, if I could just touch him. If I could just get close enough to him that I could just touch him. Even his clothes can make me whole. You see, that's where thoughts like that come from. Hearing, faith, believing that Jesus was able to do what she needed him to do. If I could just get to Jesus, if I could just touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And faith rises up within her. You know, friends, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And here we find a woman and her faith was so simple. If I could just touch his clothes, if I could just get into company with him in such a way that I could touch him, even his very clothes. And listen to me, she's now poor. This woman has got absolutely nothing to give. This woman's going to make her way. She's going to try to find her way to Jesus. And she expects no medicine from him. She just believes that he's able to do what she needs him to do. And she's prepared to give that a chance. A touch of the fringe of his garment will bring instant salvation for her. It will save her out of her situation. Her life is ebbing away. There's misery there. There's defeat. There's failure. One touch will bring her the salvation that she needs. You see, Jesus was for her the source and the center of almighty fullness. Dear one, listen to me. Don't ever forget that. Jesus is the center and he's the source of all mighty fullness. Jesus is the one who brings the power and the presence of God into your life and into mine. Jesus is the one who brings the presence and the power of almighty God into your experience and into mine. And whenever Jesus comes, the hymn writer says, the tempter's power is broken. Hallelujah. Because he brings with him the presence of Almighty God, the almighty ever-living God, who's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or ever think. Amen. He's the source and he's the center of almighty fullness. And praise God this evening, weak faith can touch that. Weak faith can touch that. What a great Savior he is. Bless his wonderful and holy name. Weak faith can touch a great Savior. Dear one, your faith can touch a great Savior tonight. In the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16 and 3, the Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Dear one, listen to me. There's no one greater than him. There's no one higher than him. There's no one more receiving than him. There's no one more loving than him. There's no one more merciful than him. And there's no one went to greater depths than him. That your soul might be touched by him. That you might meet him at your point of need. That your sin might be dealt with. That your weak faith could be established by reaching out by faith and touching him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And in her hopelessness, Jesus becomes her hope. Hallelujah. Friends, where would we be if that wasn't the truth tonight? Isn't that right? Every one of us, we were hopelessly bound in sin. We were hopelessly destined to a lost eternity. We were hopelessly lost. We were hopelessly away from God. 
new inkling of God, new desire for God. And then Jesus came. And the hymn writer says, Jesus came along and he touched me. And now I am no longer the same. He touched me by his mighty power. I don't know. Glory to his holy name. Whenever you recite the stuff, it does not the same. And I'm not going to sing it to you. But isn't it the truth? Praise God. Whenever we're hopelessly lost and hopelessly bound, Jesus is the one who becomes our hope. All of a sudden, we get a glimpse of Calvary. All of a sudden, we get a a vision. We get a realization that this one who died upon that center tree for sin died there for my sin. And Jesus becomes our hope in our hopeless situation. He becomes our hope. And although she had nothing left, Jesus, praise God, was all that she needed. She had tried everything else, but she had never been to Jesus before. Amen. She had never been to Jesus. If I could but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. Faith. Simple faith that he could meet her need. Now, she was in the crowd, just another one amongst the many who were thronging around him, just another one amongst the many who were there. And although it was difficult, although in the crowd it wasn't easy to do what she wanted to do, she hoped to do, nonetheless, she made her way, she pressed on, and she touched him. She touched him. Verse 29. Straightway, the fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. We see here her victory. Her victory. If I touch, I shall be healed. She didn't say that, listen to me, and then do nothing. She didn't say that and then do nothing. I'm not going to wait until a better time. I'm not going to wait until there are fewer people about to make it easier for me to do it. I'm not even going to wait until another day. No, no, she did something about it. She pressed in upon Jesus. Her faith brought her into personal contact with the Lord. And she received what she needed from him. According to your faith, the Bible says, be it unto you. And praise God, she found the Lord Jesus Christ to be the answer to her every need. Glory to God. See, we see here her cure was, listen to this, it was sudden. That verse says, straightway. It was sudden, it was a sudden thing. Immediately, Jesus answers the cry of trust, and he fills the hand of faith. We see that it wasn't just sudden, but we see her cure was complete, because it says the issue of blood dried up. Something happened, and now I know he touched me, and he made me whole. It was sudden. Praise God, it was complete. The very fountain of her trouble completely dried up. Bless his holy name. What he gives goes right to the very root of the problem. Right to the very root of that problem. And we see also that her cure was, her healing was consciously enjoyed. Because it says she felt in her body. Ah, she knew something had happened. It was sudden, it was complete, and she knew it had happened to her. She couldn't feel better until she was better. Friends, what a picture we see here. Because Jesus is the answer for every single one of us. Every single one of us. As God's son, Jesus came into this world. Died upon a cross at Calvary. 
see from his head, his hands, his feet. Sorrow and love. They flow mingled down. Did there such love and sorrow meet? Or thorns compose so rich a crown? There upon Golgotha's brow, Jesus died upon that cross at Calvary. The Bible says, the just one for you and I, the unjust. Why? That he might bring us to God. That he might bring us to God. And he has the power, bless his holy name, to meet every single need. Every need. If you are in sin, you're sitting in this congregation tonight and you don't know him as your Lord and Savior. Dear one, let me say this to you tonight. He can give you victory. Complete victory in your life. You may have tried to be better. You may have tried to do better what you failed. And listen, you could have tried church. You could have turned to what people call their faith. But let me ask you tonight, has your faith ever brought you into personal contact with this dear one called Jesus? Because a faith that doesn't do this is not a faith. We live in days wherever people say, oh, I have a faith. Do they? Could that be you? Because if that faith hasn't brought you into relationship or brought you into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have faith. Because that's not what faith really is. Real faith, Bible faith, believing faith is a faith that brings you into contact with the Lord Jesus Christ. She pressed in and she touched him. Friends, tonight he waits for us to come to him. He waits for us to come to him. Not coming to a church. Not coming to a particular religious denomination. Not coming to a do-it-yourself kind of, 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 of better life. But he wants us, each one of us, to touch him personally in faith. And praise God, he gives the victory into life. Glory to his name. You can be saved tonight. And maybe you need victory in some way. I want to say to you as well, brother, sister, there's victory in Jesus' name if you press in and touch him. If you do something about it. And so we've seen him save over the years. We've seen him set people free from addictions. We have seen him deliver. We have seen people who were in drugs. We have seen people who have been drinkers. We have seen all sorts of people given victory because they reached out to the Lord Jesus Christ. And over the years, praise God, we've seen him save and we've seen him change lives. Victory over all kinds of things. Victory over cigarettes. Victory over lust. Victory over alcohol. He gives victory. And he secured that for you and me the cross of Calvary. And so I'm asking you tonight as a close, where do you stand? Have you touched Jesus? Have you touched Jesus? Because if you have sinned tonight in your life and you have a need to be saved, listen to me please, and I say this with all of the love that I can find in my heart. If you have sinned in your life and you need to be saved, you are the reason you're not saved. It certainly isn't his fault because he has done everything that he can do. And all he asks you to do tonight is respond in faith. Take him at his word. Believe what you've heard about him. Take him at his word and just reach forth in faith and touch him. Touch him with your need. Touch him with your sin. And I tell you, praise God, he will change your life. He will change your hopelessness. He will change your despair. He will change your circumstances. Whatever that might be, whether it's in the area of habits, whatever, sin, sickness, praise God, he can meet every single need. But tonight I'm asking, will you come? Will you touch him tonight? Will you come to him and touch him by faith?
Thank God tonight Jesus says, him that cometh to me, I'll in no wise cast out. Oh yes, she would have been an outcast amongst the people. She shouldn't have been there. She was just another one among the crowd. But he turns to her and he says, who touched me? Because what he had imparted to her, one in the crowd met her every single need. And he can do that for you this evening. And I want to say again tonight, he is all you need. Come to him with your sin. Come to him with your helplessness. Come to him with your hopelessness. And praise God, you won't be disappointed. Because he will meet with you as you reach out to him. Let's just bow in prayer. Jesus. Jesus. Touching Jesus is all that matters. And your life will never be the same. There is only one way to touch him. And that's believe when you call on his name. Dear one, why don't you call upon him now? Just in these moments of stillness. Isn't it time you put your faith and trust in him? Call upon him now. And from the depths of your heart, just ask him to save you. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to be your savior, your savior. And just say, Lord, I'm giving my life to you. And I trust what you did for me at the cross of Calvary. I'm going to give you a moment or two just to do that. And I believe the Lord, by his spirit, I believe he's speaking in this meeting tonight. I really do. Is he speaking to you? And if he is, reach out to him now. Don't put that off. And I'm going to allow you a moment or two just to do that. To meet with him amongst this crowd because he's here. And he wants to meet with you now. Blessed Savior. Blessed Savior. Lord, these are solemn moments. Because once again, Lord, your word, your word has been proclaimed to this audience of people, Father. Lord, I'm only the voice. It's you that need to hear. Your word, your gospel, your love. And Lord, as we have sat under that word tonight, I just pray for hearts that are bowed here now. Where there's need, where there's hearts that are being lifted to you now. Meet with these people, Father. Lord, that's why we're here tonight. That we might touch Jesus. And Lord, I pray that amongst this congregation, someone or some people tonight might touch you for the first time. And know immediately the joy of sins forgiven. And so we commit each life to you now. Holy Spirit, this is your work, Lord. This is spirit, your work. Not by might, not by power. It's by my spirit, saith the Lord. Now, Lord, we stand back. And we pray, Holy Spirit, do what only you can do in every single life. And cause the word of God tonight to be fruitful. And to accomplish that whereunto you have sent it forth. In every heart. 
because we ask it giving you thanks in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.